All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Defense at Hyperscale Technologies and Policies for a Defensible Cyberspace here in South Seas GH. Uh, speaking with us today is Jason Healy. He's Senior Research Scholar, Cyber Conflict Studies at Columbia University. Um, a couple of housekeeping uh, tips for you. Stop by the business hall today. It's located in B-side A and B. Uh, Black Hat Arsenal is on in the Palm Foyer Level 3. And of course, we've got the Arsenal reception today at 5 p.m. If you haven't picked up any merchandise, uh, last chance today to visit the Schwag and Bookstore. Uh, visit Cali Len uh, the Cali Linux Lab in Mandalay, B uh, excuse me, Mandalay Bay A. And if you would, put your phones on silent and welcome Jason. Good morning. Uh, one, really happy to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Jay Healy. I teach at Columbia University um, and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Um, and I, and I'm, I love seeing there's so many folks here. One, because it's so damn early in the morning. Uh, and second, um, because I, I was a little embarrassed when I, when I actually saw the name of this talk. And I was like, oh my god, I included three buzzwords with a black hack, flag hat audience. Um, you know, I, I said cyberspace and defensible and hyperscale. Um, and so I spent about the first five minutes of this kind of like apologizing for using so many buzzwords for a black hat audience. It was right after RSA when I did this. I'm sorry it happens. Um, and uh, so I've been coming to black hat for, for, uh, for a bunch of years. And I say I, I really hope that in future years we do it the same time as the pet conference. <laughs> because it is really fantastic. I'm trying to figure out how to get like urine off into, into, my, into my presentation. I can't do it. Um, but it's great to hang out with those folks because it's so fun. They're like, yeah, were you at that Purina, Purina event last night? Yeah, right, woof, woof. Um, <laughs> it is. So I really hope, I mean, uh, we got to talk to the Black Hat crowd because um, it's just fantastic. So um, it's also great to see everyone here because this, this is a very policy talk. Um, I'm, I haven't been a practitioner for a lot of years now. I'm much more on that policy side um, of things. And so here's what we'll be talking about today in, the, in this very policy-focused talk. So, um, so again, sorry about the buzzwords in, in the title. Um, uh, I forget I used, used words like hyperspace and, and, um, and uh, defensible will come up with in cyberspace. Really, this is a talk about defense asymmetry. And defense asymmetry has come up a lot while we're here about trying to give the defender more advantages. I'm in this room yesterday, Mudge and Sarah Zatko talked about what they've been doing in the cyber independent testing labs. And um, what we're trying to do with this is, it, it, with my talk, is trying to put a little more structure around that when we talk about asymmetry of defense and what we can do about it. And not just on the technology side, but adding in the operations and policy um, to broaden that, uh, that idea out. Um, and, and so it's really struck me that we don't necessarily have a central strategy, a central um, doctrine that, that pushes us. I mean, we've got some things that, that stand in for that, but it's really struck me we don't have something that really unifies us between technology operations and policy. And that's, for me, the things like where defensible gets me at, is this asymmetry of defense and knitting all this way through. Um, and here's what I mean, like when we talk about strategy, so I spent a lot of time in DC and so, the most successful national security strategy we've had as a country was a single word, containment. And whether you're Democrat or Republican, um, you, might have, you might have disagreed about how to get about containment of the Soviet Union, but everyone agreed on that central strategy. Um, and so what's our strategy? You know, what's that, what's that one word or a couple words that is that we can all say, all right, this is what we want to try and get to, and this is what um, feeds all of our actions. And to me, it's this, these ideas of defensible that we'll be talking about here. Um, and so really the way I talk about it is I want to get defense better than offense. That'll come up. Um, and, and what I like about that is scales. You know, it can work for you as your enterprise in your, within a particular sector like the DIB or the, or the finance sector um, for a country of saying we want to make the United States cyberspace or an internet more defensible. And you can say it for the internet as a whole. And as I'll talk about in this talk, to me, the, as we've looked, the solutions that do that best give both scale and advantage. And we'll, and we'll talk about what we mean in, for scale and advantage. Um, just to throw in one more buzzword, but for me it's about being sustainable, right? We want our kids and our grandkids and their grandkids to have an internet that's at least as awesome as the one that we have today. Right, and when we look at a lot of the trends, you know, we're a pessimistic bunch, right? I'm not sure that many of us think the, the trends are going the right way. 
that that's necessarily going to be the case, that the internet's going to be as free, as awesome, as, um, um, as secure 10, 20, 100 years from now as it is today. And so that's really what motivates me when I try and come up with this overall strategy. So uh, this quote is going to sound very familiar to so many of you. I mean, if you've done any red taming, I'm sure we've heard this time and time again here. Few, if any, contemporary computer security controls have prevented a dedicated red team. So um, I did the, um, one of the things that I, I um, edited the first so history book of cyber conflict. And this was my favorite quote from doing that, uh, from doing that history book. Right, this sounds very familiar for us. We all know, we all know this. Unfortunately, oh, and so for me, I took this and I said, all right, this is true because offense is, is easier than defense. The attacker has an easier time, right? It's attacker asymmetry, attacker advantage. I like, I use this O is greater than D to help represent that. I'm saying that offense has the easier time, the attacker has the advantage. So far, so common, we know, we know that at Black Hat. But what really struck me about this quote is from 1979. So before probably most of us um, were in the business, before some of you were probably born, um, so for 35 years, over 35 years, it's, we've been attacker advantage. The attackers had an easier time. And so for, 30, for over 35 years, so what the hell have we been doing for 35 years, right? All of those evenings that you didn't go, go home for dinner, all of those weekends where we got stuck at the office dealing with some kind of worm, all those missed baseball games, plays, um, all that time we could have been doing something else. All of those tens of billions of dollars we've been spending, all of the patents, all of the hard work that we've been doing, all the DEF CONs, all the black hats, all the RSAs, all of that. I don't want to say it has, has been for nothing, but for all of that work we've put in, and we haven't changed this fundamental fact of our business, that the attacker has the advantage for over 35 years. So what have we learned during our time here at Black Hat that's fundamentally going to change this relationship, to change attacker advantage? So you can see why I zoom into this as, as the fundamental thing. We've got to change this. How long can a system stay where one side has an advantage year after year, decade after decade, and you don't hit a tipping point? So to me, it's fundamentally about this attacker advantage. So the asymmetry of offense. So I kind of simplify this down to saying, um, I'll usually say a dollar, but really I mean an hour or, or, or some measure spent on attack buys a far more than a dollar spent on defense. And you can see where I'm starting to zoom in on where I think the, the main problems are going to be. So I won't spend too long on this slide of why is it the, the attacker advantage? We, we, we all generally know this. You've probably been hearing this a, a bunch. You know, the internet was never really designed for security. It was, it was designed for connectivity, software weaknesses, um, uh, attacker initiative. Um, you know, we've got to defend everywhere. They, have to, they, they just have to get right once. And you notice a lot of these quotes, right? A lot of these quotes are, are, are more than 10 years old. So it's not like I'm giving you any news. It's not like we, we haven't known this for a long time. It's just that I don't think we've gone about trying to solve these problems in the right way. Um, we we mis-aim our solutions. Um, I, love, I love this quote from, from Phil, um, who I used to work for. Need more secure products, not more security products. Also, we're just continue to add complexity. I mean, we're starting to get so many systems layered on top of systems that no one can really understand this. Uh, one of my buddies, Bill Woodcock, put it as, you know, we can't keep modeling an, infin an infinite series of monsters under the bed. And so as it starts getting more and more complex, we can't understand it, it makes it more difficult to defend, and of course, troublesome, troublesome humans. So we all understand that problem. So let's get into what I think we need to do about it. So for me, if the problem is that offense has an easier time than defense, then the strategy has to be as equally clear that we need to get that defense better than offense. I spoke at Black Hat two years ago a little bit about this. I was calling it saving the internet or saving cyberspace. And, um, and so that's what I want to get. I wanted to get the D larger than O, or even better, 
D way better than O. You know, double crocodile is like you teach your kid, you know. The, um, but is that even possible? A lot of folks I talk to um, would say, ah, that can't even happen. We can't even get to that place to think that, that we can get the internet as a whole, cyberspace as a whole, to be defense advantage. And that, that, I thought that was a little bit too bad that I was having these DC policymakers say that. Because um, right, if you don't think you're ever going to be able to get it better, then you might as well keep doing, um, then there's no reason to limit your own offense. But, um, so this part of the work is part of, is um, at Columbia University, we've been putting together a um, New York Cyber Task Force. Uh, a lot of folks from New York in it, a lot of, um, um, a lot of the banks, my, my dean is co-chair along with Greg Rattray at J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as Phil Venables at um, Goldman Sachs. Um, but it's a nice mix of academics and practitioners from, from New York, D.C., a few other places, uh, to try and take on these three questions. What do we mean by defensible? Why hasn't it been defensible to date? We just talked about that. Um, what have we done in the past that's had both scale and advantage? And then based on that, what should we do, do next? The idea, oh, um, so defensible, we've made up these things. Agile, um, uh, uh, instrumented, measurable, we should be able to know things more, more easily than, than we can in our current environment. Multi-stakeholder collaborative, it's not dominated by governments, it's easy for us to, to discuss. Well-governed, um, I'm, I'm a little shaky on the word policed here. I don't mean policed in the sense of, you know, whoop, whoop, you know, like police coming in, but that um, it ties in with the, with the next point, few externalities. Um, right now, so much of, of, of our problems are um, someone can force their security problems onto us. Um, someone somewhere else on the internet doesn't, doesn't take care of their, their security situation, and then we have to deal with that um, because of, for example, DDoS, and of course, resilient. So where we really came at this, and where I think is the, the central part of this briefing where I want to spend the most time, is what have we done in the past that's made the biggest difference? And you'll see why I think that's, that's important. About two years ago, the, the Economist magazine um, came out with a piece on climate change. And this is, this is from that article. Where they said, all right, what interventions have we done that have taken the most carbon dioxide equivalent tons out of, out of the environment. And you can say they, kind of, they, they did this ranking of them. And I bring this up for two reasons. One, there was some, a real um, kind of a surprise. Anyone even heard of that, that top one of um, the Montreal Protocol? Uh, that was the CFCs, taking, taking out the chlorofluorocarbons. And, and what they did in the article was, was they also talked about how expensive these were. So uh, we spent a lot of money, for example, on nuclear um, power and hydropower. I mean, that's a lot of money that got spent on those. And yet both of those added together was less than what we did to take CFCs out, out of the air. So one, it was kind of surprising that, you know, when, when you look at this. But what really struck me was that The Economist said, as far as we can tell, no one has ever asked what interventions we've made made the biggest difference at least cost. So here it is. I mean, climate change. And this is, this is meant to be a big deal, right? This huge public policy issue supposedly, and yet no one had looked at it and said, what have we done that's made the biggest difference at least cost? And man, the light bulb just went over my head and said, for our business, what have we done that has made the biggest difference that the largest scale at the least cost? Either within enterprise or for the internet or cyberspace as a whole. And so we st I started this as this process about two years ago to start asking folks to say, what do you think that we have done at the most scale and least cost? And we really came into a couple ideas that really underlay this. So one, uh, and I'm going to go through this list of technologies, opera uh, um, um, operational um, solutions and policy. I'll, I'll go through that next and what the answers so far have been. What the answers had, they had both advantage and scale. So by advantage, it is a dollar of defense has to buy more than a dollar of attack, just to start with. Some don't, like compliance. We spend a dollar or an hour, you know, whatever unit, on compliance, right? It doesn't cost the attacker an hour or a dollar to bypass that. It probably costs them, what, what like 0.2 dollars to bypass our compliance. 
So we've got to flip this around with our, with our, with our solutions. But it's not just enough because there's way more of them than us. So it can't just be we spend a dollar and it costs them two dollars or three dollars to bypass it. It's got to be, it has to have scale. If we spend X, they have to, it has to cost them 10X, 1000X, even a million X. I'm not kidding. Our solutions need to be a million X here. And here's where we say hyperscale and, and I promised the, the um, speaker liaison folks that I was going to, that I had to say hyperscale. So um, uh, see so if you can tell, if you can tell the, the, the guys I said that. And so I mean it literally one million X is what we've got to aim for in our kinds of solutions. And if we're not getting million X, we need to start thinking about how we can innovate to get them to that amount. So, um, the, so what was the worst as we talked about this? Um, I've already talked about compliance. I don't think I have to convince you that that's compliance isn't a million X payoff, right? But we also looked at the policy side. And, um, and if people know the Vassanar Agreement, this was an um, arms export, it was an arms export treaty of trying to make sure that um, uh, we weren't getting weapons into the wrong hands. And um, over the last couple of years, governments have been trying to apply it to our area. And it's just been a disaster. It's been awful. Um, Jeff Moss got really involved. He was able to kind of get a lot of the community together to work against it. And, um, and, and to show what I mean about how this was so bad because it didn't bring scale or advantage, I was talking with one of the large computer security companies. We had an event at this at the Atlanta Council so we could talk about it. We had the Commerce Department and the State Department and the um, security researchers and cybersecurity companies. And, and one of the big vendors said, right now we have 10 export licenses that we need for our company um, if we're, for us to for deal with these issues. If the Vossner agreement went through the way it was supposed to, they stopped counting at needing 1,000 export licenses. They just said, forget it, we're done. And if you think that that would have stopped the attackers anywhere near as much as it would have stopped one of these big cybersecurity vendors from having to ask for a thousand export licenses. And so the kind of thing that this would have limited, and fortunately it did get stopped, was if you were Symantec, say, and you had some future Stuxnet, and your team was looking at it in the US, and you wanted to do a follow the clock on it and pass it to your team in Asia, you're now passing a munition and so you need an export license. Even though you're just, it's just a security research team that's trying to figure out how to stop this dangerous and potentially deadly attack. You now can't do that without, unless, you had an, unless you had had an export license. So again, it got stopped, but that's exactly the kind, that's exactly the opposite of what we're talking about. It doesn't bring scale, it doesn't bring advantage. So, Here's the top 10 technology. We're, we're still working through this with the New York Cyber Task Force. Um, I'm not sure they actually know I'm giving this talk, so um, don't tell them. And so here's the top 10 that we've come up with so far, and then I'll talk to you. We've got, um, well, but out here in Vegas, I've, I've started to get some other ideas that, are, that have brought in. <clears throat> so automated updates. To me, this is the classic example of one million X. Because I'm not saying it was cheap for Microsoft to roll this out in 98 when they did, or, and, and not just Windows Update, but all automated updates. Well, I, I'm sure it wasn't cheap or easy for them to do this. But think of the amazing payout that we've gotten for that. I bet it is at least a million X of that we've gotten from that initial investment that you put in to make sure that, um, system, that systems are easily patched. To me, this is one of the best examples of million X. Oh, and um, so where there's a quote that's, um, that's usually but not always um, a quote that we had gathered as part of, uh, as part of this project. Um, and if there's, uh, and it's always, the quote is always associated with the, fir the first name listed. <clears throat> um, Cloud-based architecture, I was really, really surprised. Again, not having been a practitioner for a couple of years, I was really surprised how much two of the key people in our, in our task force Phil Venables and Ed Amoroso pushed cloud. Um, and Ed, I thought, put it great of um, so many of our problems are because we are built on a crappy architecture that is insecurable. It is indefensible. 
because the architecture is just bad from the foundation all the way up. And so that's so many of our problems as, as security professionals is trying to, trying to build as best as we can on this incredibly shaky and insecure foundation. And so what um, people like Ed push is, uh, when, and when he was at AT&T, is saying, now we can build this from a secure foundation on the correct architecture based on the cloud, and we can do it the entire way while letting the, CIA, the CIO think we're doing it for him just to save costs. So we can do it to save costs, but we can also build a secure architecture on the way up. I was very, very surprised in how, um, um, in how supportive Ed and Phil were on this. But then I started to think about it. a lot of my formative moments were think, uh, when back in the, the age of the great worms, you know, we're getting by, by NIMDA, SQL, Slammer, and the rest. And you're thinking about whenever we would get hit with one of those, or, or if you have an intrusion now, right, you've got you've to detect it, you've got to go, you've got to um, uh, reprovision a computer to that person, grab that computer, bring it back to the lab. Um, it kind of sits there until the tech can get to it. You know, he'll take it, he'll re-image it, clean it up, um, and then we're ready to reprovision it back out to someone. You know, now that we've got virtualization, containerization, right? There's no, there's no physical computer that you've got to worry about. Um, you know, if it gets on, you can just take it down, reinstantiate for the person, and, and now instead of the attacker having to do this much work and the defender having to do this much, it, become, it becomes much more even. Okay, encryption, encryption, another one of those clear million X payoffs. Uh, my colleague at, at um, Columbia University, Steve Bellavin, um, really pushes hard on this, right? S encryption is about the only place where natively the defender has the advantage over the attacker if implemented correctly, Steve always puts in parentheses, it's one of the few places, eh, the largest place, where natively, organically, the defense has the advantage over the attacker. And that's why Steve is so vigorous in expressing to the government, please don't mess with encryption, right? This is the one thing that we've got that works, the one tool that actually, actually works. So let's not start messing with it. Um, secure default configurations. Uh, I got this from, from a, um, a DHS official that really, um, really enjoyed um, this one. And I like it because, again, it's not, it's not one of these big ideas like automated updates, but it's one of those things that does bring scale advantage, makes things significantly easier if done correctly. Um, I added Kerberos together with authentication beyond passwords um, that uh, Bruce Schneier brought up. And here, you know, you imagine things like, you know, how, how much more secure we were after the introductions of RSA tokens than before, right? Uh, things like RSA tokens moved us into this brand new space where all of a sudden um, we could be far more secure and it really scaled up. You know, I'm not saying it was easy to, you know, to implement Kerberos correctly or to bring out two-factor um, two authentication, but it, it at, for how much work it cost us, it cost the attackers far, far more. Um, uh, Mike Aiello, Goldman Sachs, put in uh, mass vulnerability scanning. You know, what could happen once we got NMAP and, and, and the products like it? Uh, Mark Sox added in built in NAT for home, home routers. You know, how many, uh, how many homes were now safer, or if you're using home routers, because you had NAT and those networks were no longer easily visible to attackers. Um, uh, really helped when, when those got rolled out, what, you know, 10, 10 15 years ago. Uh, and I, I changed this one up. This had just been ASLR, but I really changed it having, having heard um, uh, Mudge and Sarah on this, this same stage yesterday to, to broaden out to developer environment security. Uh, for ASLR, for um, heap protection, kernel memory protection, everything that's being done on, on fortification, of software, it's one of those, and, and if you saw their talk, it's it was really great on being able to go in and, and we just know how to do software better, and if you do it correctly with things like this, we're using the right libraries and the rest, um, it can make, uh, you know, using more secure commands, what a difference that it can make if you're doing software development correctly. Um, and the last one of the top 10, uh, and the, again, these might change. Uh, Richard Baitlick added in DDoS protection, which I thought was an interesting one. A lot of the other ones are, are kind of solutions or they're kind of engineering. Uh, Richard pointed out, and I think, I think he's right, that if you can pay for DDoS protection, it just puts you in a, 
it helps you solve it in a way that so many of other problems can't be so easily solved. I'm not saying it necessarily gives both scale and advantage so that attacker is, uh, defender is better than attacker, but I thought it was an interesting example. Um, uh, my colleague Bo Woods at Atlanta Council, he's added in a few more. Um, so we just got these last week, so we still haven't really talked about them yet within the, uh, the, the New York Cyber Task Force to figure out how we like it. But I really like it. I mean, for example, like language choice controls retirement. Um, you know, Phil Venables had one he threw in, in in retiring legacy systems, and I think those are all interesting. But it's not, so in, so we said, all right, well, so, so far these gave us scale and advantage. So what can we learn based on these technologies about what might be the next game-changing technologies? Um, I was really surprised to hear about that formal methods are coming back. You know, when I learned about them in a classroom, I figured that they were just something that would always stay in the lab, stay in the classroom, but provably secure. Um, provably no, no bugs. And this used to be prohibitively expensive and it's re the cost of this has really come down where this really might change our business and, the, uh, and how we do our business. Um, the Cyber Independent Testing Lab, I love, again, what, what Mudge and Sarah were talking about yesterday, large scale consumer report style measurement of, of how good code is. Uh, security scorecards, um, things like BitSight, um, they might not be absolutely correct, but boy, they can, they, they can really change behavior for, for not a high, high cost. Um, soft, uh, compiler generates software diversity, and of course I had to add software solution, uh, security solutions for IoT. If we don't get IoT right, then we are fundamentally screwed for a long, uh, for a long time to come. Uh, I added um, uh, cloud deployment. Because I've had a lot of, as we were talking about this, we had a number of CISOs, and yeah, I'll mention Phil Venables again, who just came in and really pushed. It's not just more secure because you can be on a new security architecture, more secure architecture from the ground up. And, and of course, cloud introduces its own security problems. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to say that it's perfect. It, it, it of course adds its own security problems. But it really struck me in how some of these CISOs would say, once you get a, past a critical point in your, where you've got so much compute and memory that's, that, that's stored in one place, data in one place, it just allows you to transform your security organization. All of a sudden you can start doing so much more um, in detection and response um, that they really think in the next five years that this can really transform the way that we do our industry. So what, so as we got this list we said, all right, what, a, what makes these things so special? What is it about these 10, 20 technologies that give them scale and advantage? How can we, how can we spot the trends that make these things special? And these were really the five, the, the five things that we pulled out of that. Um, one, they can take away entire classes of attacks. You know, Dan Kaminsky always talks about this. You know, if we change random this way, if we change this other function, then we can take out um, race conditions, we can take out entire classes of attacks. And I think that's what we really need to be aiming for. Um, this quote is from Arati Prabhakar, who is the, uh, the head of DARPA. And that's what they're really trying to do, is just take away entire classes of attacks. Um, Bruce pointed out that a lot of these take the user out of the solution. Um, that, you know, the system's patched by default and the user doesn't have to do anything. The system is encrypted by default, where the communications are encrypted and the user doesn't have to take any kind of specific action. Um, Jeff brought up those responsible make a change that helps all their users. And he was bringing this up, especially from Microsoft and automated updates, but I think you can see it in a lot of places where a particular vendor um, uh, takes an action. It doesn't necessarily cost them a lot, but then we all get to benefit because of it. Rather than to solve this on a billion endpoints, um, you go to the folks that can really fix the problem and keep it solved. Um, Phil likes to talk about improving security by decreasing the cost of control. And you can see that in, my, in my, um, my example earlier about the containerization virtualization, right? It costs almost nothing now to, to bring up a new instantiation um, if it's been owned. Uh, and um, Art brought up ag agility detection and resilience, okay. But it's not just about technology. Um, I, I, We've spent more time on the technology because it's a little bit easier to get our heads around it. It's a little bit easier to measure and imagine what the game-changing solutions are. But they're not the only ones. 
and thanks for your patience as, <laughs> as we go through this. I'll try and, I'll try and come up with another pet joke um, here if I can. In the 1980s, someone had to innovate and come up with the idea of, of the first computer emergency response team. It was after the Morris worm, and they didn't have an organization that was responsible for, for figuring out what vulnerabilities were out there, trying to get them patched, and that would be in charge after the incident started. We had to invent it. We had to innovate and say, let's create this. DARPA, DUD, said, good, we'll create one of these at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and now look, right, everyone has to have a cert. It was an innovation, and so I'm really curious what the next organizational innovation is going to be, right? So we don't often think about organizational innovation as part of this. We don't often think of process innovation, but that's exactly what Lockheed Martin gave us with the kill chain, right? There's no real technology there the way that we think about technology at Black Hat. They said, here's a new way to think about this and a new way to structure your defense around this process, around this thought. And just look at all the innovations. I saw a couple of Black Hat talks that were, that were including the kill chain. And so um, I think it's a fantastic example where you can get scale and advantage from a process innovation and rather a technological one. Uh, you're starting to see this in automated threat, share, uh, automated threat sharing. Um, We've got the uh, folks in the FSI SAC on our, our cyber task force and they've shared you know, their results of how um, um, the, the old trust model of sharing and trying to get things done by emails um, would take hours if not days and now they're able to get that down within, within seconds or minutes for automated sharing, information sharing out based on sticks and taxi. Um, I like institutionalized bug bounty programs. I mean what we've seen um, both within vendors um, like what Katie put together in Microsoft, or groups like HackerOne, um, Hack the Pentagon, uh, some, I think, really fantastic solutions here um, for, for quite low cost. Uh, the work of volunteer groups like the Configure Working Group, NSPSEC, and others, um, Industry Alliances, and Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. Um, maybe an odd one to bring up um, in, in Black Hat, but it made a big difference between governments. Um, there's probably 35 countries that have signed now. And before that, there wasn't harmonization between countries on what was illegal or not. Uh, if you remember, what was it, which was it, I love you, that you know, this Filipino hacker, um, virus writer that put it together, it wasn't illegal in the Philippines. That's much less likely to happen now. If you, if you sign this treaty, then you say you'll have a 24-7 point of contact. So in case there's a fast moving cyber crime happening, uh, that nations can contact one another. It's a policy solution but it really does bring the scale and advantage. A few others that I, wanted to, uh, that I really, really love and they're a little bit more recent. International norms, indictments, and sanctions. Um, so I spend my time in the political science world um, and I'll tell you, it was easy for a lot of us, both in the political science world as well as within um, our community here, when the indictment of the five PLA officers came out, I think pretty much it meant with universal scoffing. <laughs> oh good, you're, you're indicting five Chinese, five Chinese military officers, that's gonna bring down Chinese espionage. You know, and, um, and it turns out it did. It looks like it did. Um, threat of sanctions last year, the, um, leading up to President Obama and President Xi agreeing to, to um, no commercial espionage. It looks like it really did make a significant difference despite all of our predictions that it wouldn't. Um, this came out from FireEye um, only about, about a month ago. And you can see that it first started to come down. That first big drop was around the time of the PLA indictments. That second big drop, what really came down, was in the run up to President Obama and President Xi. This is what was detected. We still, this is only one source. Uh, Department of Justice, um, John Carlin came out and said they saw the same thing. So they did say that yes, it looks like um, uh, this, is, this is a true trend. Um, and so it's one of those things that really surprised us. What else have we done for so little cost to drop Chinese espionage? Right? If we would have developed a new AV solution and put it out there and led to an over 90% drop in Chinese espionage, we would have been cheering. Look at this fantastic new tool I deployed, boss. Um, you know, I should get a, I should get a great bonus because we did this. We were able to do this not by having a thousand companies 
install a new product, but because diplomats and others went to them and said, and prosecutors went and said, you need to change your behavior. So it really shocked us that this happened, but I think it's one of the most successful things that we've done. Also, uh, the, the White House has made two policy default decisions. And these really matter in policy. If you say, instead of treating this as a balance and we'll do it case by case, you can simplify things if the boss just says, no, um, here's how we're going to make the decision every time, and it's up to the other side to prove it, to, you know, to say that, that we won't make the decision. So there is a U.S. government bias that, uh, that's been in place strongly since 2014, that when the U.S. government gets their hands on a vulnerability, they will not keep it for law enforcement, war fighting, or espionage, but they'll tell the vendor. Um, it's called the Vulnerabilities Equities Process. I'm speaking about this tomorrow at DEF CON um, in the morning, opening up track one. And um, it's incredible. It looks like who would have guessed that the government keeps far, far fewer vulnerabilities than we ever would have thought. I would have guessed, and I came out of the military cyber warfare community, mostly defense, but a little bit offense. Most of us thought the government probably keeps hundreds, thousands of vulnerabilities. And last year, it looks like they kept two. And in my DEF CON talk, we'll examine that and we'll try and disprove that and we'll get into more depth. But it's one of those that it looks like public policy made a big difference. Um, another one of these public policy default decisions that the White House made was a few years ago, saying if we come across information in the US government, either through law enforcement sensitive or signals intelligence, that a US company or US organization had an intrusion, our default position is we are going to tell that company. I used to work at the White House. When we were there, we did not have such a policy. It was, you know, the, the FBI folks would say, we're not going to tell. Intelligence folks say, we're not going to tell. It, it would, it would uh, jeopardize sources and methods. Um, you know, then the bad guys know that we know, that they know that we know. They, cha they changed that and said, nope, defense first, we're going to tell. And you can see this from the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And now, the number one way that, company, that organizations find out they've been owned is being told by law enforcement. And you can see, um, uh, it, might be, it might be difficult to see, um, it's that um, kind of purpley, periwinkle um, colored line. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know colors. I'm not, I'm not a pet, pet guy. Um, and uh, <laughs> that, that was really lame that you guys laughed at. That was awful. Um, and, uh, but you can see it went from being nothing to now being the number one. That's what a successful public policy looks like. Okay, um, I added this in, um, uh, cyber independent testing lab, um, in being able to test binaries, repeatable manner, and compare. This is the slide from, again, from Mudge and Sarah um, yesterday, and in, in comparing the overall security between major browsers that they've done by, um, um, by looking at the binaries, and, and how much they use ASLR heat protection stack guards and fortified source. All right. Uh, closing it out here. Yeah. Um, and this is so important to me because the, it's not like the only futures are continued status quo of offense staying better than defense or flipping around to defense being better than offense. It could be far worse where the attackers don't just have the advantage, they have supremacy. Or we can maybe just imagine flipping that around to have defense supremacy not just advantage, but that we really own them. And any time they want to do something, it's incredibly difficult for them to try and get us. So when I was at the Atlanta Council, we did some work on this with the Zurich Insurance Group. And we, and we did some modeling um, with the University of Denver to say, what are the results on global GDP if we get this right or wrong? So we had the best case we called Cyber Shangri-La. And in cyber, I was feeling really, feeling re really literary when, when, I, when I did this. Um, so in cyber Shangri-La, we get almost all of the benefits of the, all the new technologies, right? When you open Wired or, or popular, popular American, whatever, wherever you see your new techs, you open it up and, they, and they're so breathless about this new technology that's coming. Smart grid, internet of things, whatever. And we get 
almost all of the benefits out of that because we can secure almost all of those very well. And in that future, we get $30 trillion of added global GDP through 2030. $30 trillion of added benefit. Then we said, well, what if we go the other way and it's attacker supremacy? What happens then? So we call this the clockwork orange internet. And so what we meant by that, what, what does that look like? In, in the best future, Cyber Shangri-La, secure broadband connectivity is a global right. Pretty much regardless of whatever country you live in, wherever you live in the world, being able to connect and be yourself on the internet in cyberspace is a right that belongs to you as a human being. In the Clockwork Orange internet, it's a luxury good. And it's only the 1% that can afford to connect securely. Where instead of being, you can be whoever you want online, now it's something that's flaunted like a Louis Vuitton bag. Because every time we try and roll out some new solution, it gets, we roll out a new internet 2.0. It gets taken down by governments, by organized crime, by well-meaning security researchers who bring it down before we've got appropriate solutions in place. And there we saw it down $90 trillion in global GDP through 2030. Um, stunning, stunning amount that we were looking at. Um, if you're interested in that, um, that report was, um, it was called Risk Nexus, um, Overcome by Cyber Risks. Um, where you can just and it, um, look for Zurich Insurance or, or, or my name. And so there is, how are we doing? So if those are two potential futures, one awesome, one terrible, how are we doing? Um, there are some statistics that out there that can help us think about it. Um, the one on the bottom is from the Index of Cybersecurity that Dan Geer has been um, involved with for a few years. Um, and they look back five years. And so what that line shows is they went and asked a bunch of um, uh, security professionals, are you more worried about the next month than you were about the current month? Do you think next month is going to be worse than the current month? And every month for the last five years, it's come back, yes, I'm more worried about next month. If we start getting defensible right, we'll hopefully start to see that edging down. The, I love the Verizon Data Breach Investigations report. Because every year they say, how long in days do the bad guys spend getting in? How long once they're in before they get detected? And how long once they get detected until they get kicked out? And you can see the text here from, from Verizon. It's not going well. There's some sign of improvement. But generally, the detection deficit's getting worse. And they're getting faster at compromising us. And that means we're, we're, we're tending towards those worst futures. If we want to get defensible, we should start seeing that come down. Or as we are becoming more defensible, we should see that start coming down. So um, last slide. So for us to get there. Um, so again, maybe you like the buzzwords, maybe you don't. Um, for more defensible cyberspace, we need both advantage and scale. For me, I like to think of that end goal as a sustainable internet, a sustainable cyberspace, one that's going to be at least as awesome 20 or 50 or 250 years from now as it is today. Um, and to me, that defensibility has got to be that central strategy so that we can find that scale and, a, scale and advantage. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I guess. Bye. Okay. Um, and we've got, uh, I guess, seven minutes. So if, if folks have questions, uh, we can we can take questions, or I'll catch up with everyone afterwards. Cheers. Oh, and uh, tomorrow, DefCon talk on vulnerabilities. Okay. Uh, do you want to go to the mic? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, great. I, I got a question at the mic here. Go ahead. Yes. 
Uh, I've got one question. So you were showing the slide where uh, since the agreement between China and U.S. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's gone down by 90 percent. But you're, you're still saying that everyone's more worried next month and this month and attackers are getting faster. So did that have no impact? Um, I, I think there's still, there's still a lot of doubt on this. Um, some of it justified of saying, all right, what are other companies saying? Can we, can we figure out this is definitely, definitely the case? Um, and I think a lot of, uh, still it, it, it hasn't quite sank in. I mean, this was only, I don't know, it was probably last month this came out, so. Yeah, I was just wondering if there are other actors out there that are causing most yeah. of the concern. And, and, and I think, if anything, we're probably a lot more worried now about Russia. I mean, I, th I think as people were maybe saying, good, the China thing's come down now, now we're seeing the Russia thing go up. Um, and not just as far as espionage, but as far as disruption. Or organized crime. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, well, especially in Russia. I mean, especially right now, Russia and, and the disruptive is, okay. um, you know, trying to see these hybrid attacks. But it's a good question. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you had a slide on technical solutions that provided the most bang for the buck. Uh, th that's among solutions that have been implemented. Right. Are you aware of anything in development or something sitting on the shelf that we should push for? Um, that's why I added this one. We haven't gotten into the, it, 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 it's, it, it's the exact question that I'm trying to get to on this. Um, and we haven't gotten into it in a deep way yet in the task force. So these are the ones that we've got so far. Again, if there's anything to me, it's cloud, it's cloud that came through. You know, trying to do cloud correctly and then once you get a critical mass, uh, you know, just a lot of, of your compute and data in one place and then really being able to jump, jump away from there. So, and, and just to say, and so I really, it really gets me, for example, when you see U.S. government trips over themselves of saying, are we saving money? Is cloud the right thing? And what we found overwhelmingly is, is they're, they're focusing on the wrong issues and then should do cloud as secure as they can and then they'll get all sorts of great benefits out of it that might not be, seem seem right now to the bean counters. So is the, the, the primary benefit there the co-location of the data that allows you to um, you know, see uh, things step, that are coming? Step one is building on secure architecture. Okay. And again, I'm, I'm kind of channeling Ed Amoroso here. So I'm, Ed's really the one that's written on this. But starting with the secure architecture because then you can build up. And then we're starting to hear people say once you've got that in the right place, then the way that you can do analytics, detection, response okay. becomes in a real, real step change. Okay. Thank great. you. Thanks. Question on this side? Uh, no. Over here. Okay. Yeah, I kind of wanted to follow up on the first one about your China statistics. Yep. Uh, one, I, I run one of the federal government's top ten data centers, and we have seen zero decline in China attacks. In fact, they increase every day. Well, so where, where does that data come technically from? Technically, this, this, this is about commercial. The agreement was about not commercial spying uh, or not spying for commercial purposes. Um, this was fire eye data. So what the numbers were were um, the number of um, companies com um, compromise conducted. Um, so each of these, I believe, is one company that wasn't um, compromised. So this is representing like 65 companies per month that didn't get compromised. And so, I mean, to me, U.S. government is your valid intelligence target for the Chinese, just like they're a valid intelligence target for us. Okay. So, yeah. um, one thanks. question over here. Hi. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't even see no, you the mic over yeah. there. I'm short and over here. Hey, so. man. Hey, good to see you. That works out. Um, I like the argument you made about advantage and scale. Yep. Um, how would you value the dollars and time spent, that, that whatever the unit measure, unit measure is, that f let's say the financial sector entities have to spend with the myriad of regulators which are disconnected yeah. and have different end states, um, which is a sizable investment not just in time but also in hu human capital across yeah. our organizations. Furthermore, making how we make investment decisions based on the fact that we don't want to be victim blamed yeah. at the end of the day if we do get breached by the government. Yeah, a couple um, blamed by the government if you get breached, not if you get breached by the if government. The litigation yeah. okay. seems to favor the yeah. attacker. Um, yeah, without a doubt. The, uh, and that's why I take this into different slices. I mean, so one, if I'm talking to, to someone in an enterprise of saying what is that you can do to get scale advantage, right? And when people say, all right, I'm going I'm to push education. I'm not sure that education, you get 10x or 100x out of it. You can do education in that way. Um, and so one is wherever we can to try and find that scale and advantage. Second is, you know, like I talk about this with the lawyers in the ABA of saying, all right, where can we get, you know, where can we get this legal innovation so that the law actually inhibits the bad guys more than it inhibits us? And last week, the regulators. Where, when we take this principle in, with a where can we get regulation that maybe helps free things up. If it's regulation for compliance, it's not helping. 
I, I love, I think that fits into this, I, I actually need to add it, the SEC guidance that said if you get, if you have a materially significant breach, it's up to the board to tell the investors. That regulation is like six freaking pages. Um, and all it does is say this existing market governance mechanism, it applies here as well. It uses the market structure, it regulates by transparency rather than regulating a security standard. So, so that's why me, it's a strategy, right? It gives me the same tool that I can use for all of these different scales within the enterprise, with the regulators, with the, with, uh, with the lawyers. So, and I'm sure uh, members of the Chicago community would be interested in participating as well. So. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Yeah, last question, then we got to go. Yes. Um, I saw uh, in one of your slides uh, you mentioned the impact on the global revenue of government control. Could uh -huh. you explain what you meant by that? Um, which one? Uh, the, it, yeah, oh, with the, the GDP, yeah, yeah, yeah. it says something, the, the impact of government control was $30 trillion. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there were two other um, uh, futures I didn't talk about in this one. Um, we had, one was the um, independent internet and the other was Leviathan. So Leviathan was um, where we have very, very strong internet borders where, um, you know, kind of like you see Russia and China now, where if you go online, your online identity and your online experience is dominated by the country where you, uh, where you come in from. Um, and so there, that was actually, um, that was only, that would dropped, um, yeah, 30, so 30, tri yeah, 30 trillion down we saw in that. The opposite one we called independent internet. So in Leviathan, every time a director Comey says, thou shalt not, he's able to win it almost every time, in whatever country, you know, the director Comey of, of you know, in Russia, in China, in Ecuador, in, um, in, in Kenya, the government always wins that. We said in the independent internet, every time the director Comey says thou shalt not, the techies pretty much are able to outfox them and say no, it's not going to work this way, we'll invent something. Um, I call that one the full Barlow for those that, you know, for the John Perry Barlow. And, um, and in that one, that was actually pretty close to the base case. So, all right, that, that's my time. So, great. Thanks very much. Uh, and maybe see you tomorrow at Black Hat. <laughs>